do an introduction. Uh, mostly it's gonna be an introduction and we're gonna do the first letter. Um, the, the Rambam Maimonides starts with a, a letter that he wrote to one of his students explaining why he's writing this book. Ostensibly, the book is written as a, uh, as, as a letter to his student. So we're, we'll hopefully we'll cover that letter today and we'll cover uh, a, just a, an introduction. <clears throat> and in my introduction, I wanna explain a little bit about why I chose this safer, why so many people have not studied this, this book yet, what scares people away, and what, how I plan on handling uh, those, those, those aspects and why I think it's so relevant. So first of all, this book was written by Maimonides, Rambam, who, um, who uh, lived uh, from the mid uh, 1100s and passed away in the early 1200s. And um, he wrote this book near the end of his life. He wrote it in 1190 something. Um, and he wrote it in <clears throat> what was his uh, native language, Judeo-Arabic, uh, which is, uh, in all the lands where Jews lived, pretty much, we managed to take the local language and make a Jewish form of it. So Jews that lived in the Arabic lands did the same thing with Arabic and made Judeo-Arabic, which is written very similar to a lot of the other Jewish languages like Yiddish and Ladino. Ladino is like Judeo-Spanish, uh, Yiddish, Judeo-German. We write it in Hebrew letters. So the, all the original manuscripts are written in Hebrew letters, but mostly Arabic writing. <clears throat> But within the Rambam's lifetime, it was already clear that for the book to be widespread among Jews, it would have to be translated into Hebrew because there were many Jews living uh, still in Spain who were more familiar with Spanish. There were Jews in Europe, more familiar with French and German and, and, and English, or whatever else that they were familiar with in the other places of the various places of diaspora. So in order to make it widespread, it had to be translated. So the first translation was written in the Rambam's lifetime by, the, by, uh, by Shmuel Ibn Tibbon, uh, who, uh, the famous Ibn Tibbon family, who translated numerous manuscripts in, uh, from, from Arabic and, and, and into Hebrew. Um, and the Rambam approved his first translation. The, one, the translation that most European Jews were familiar with until recently was the Ibn Tibbon translation. The problem with the Ibn Tibbon translation is that Ibn Tibbon himself writes with trepidation that he wanted to be as true to the Rambam's words as possible. So he translated as literally as he possibly could, which as you know, when you translate from one language into another, it becomes extremely difficult, extremely choppy, and it doesn't translate well when you go from one language into another. So there were many other attempts. There were attempts at translating it into, into Latin because it became very uh, uh, widespread among Christians, and we'll understand why as we study the book. Um, the, this book became a bedrock of Christian philosophy. A, a lot of Thomas Aquinas' writings are based on, and he directly quotes from, from the great rabbi, who was uh, none other than the Rambam himself. And he, just, he was one of the first to really take head on issues that, that, um, that are so, so important to us uh, uh, and, and still bother us to this day, such as the problem of evil, theodicy, you know, how, why good, bad things happen to good people. The Rama was one of the, the first to really, to really uh, 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 go philosophically deeply into those topics. So, um, but then, and much more recently, we have a couple of translations. Early in the 20th century, there's a, 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 a Friedlander translation, a, a Dr. Friedlander, and that is available online everywhere. And I, I put up the link on the site. But if you if you didn't get the link um, in our WhatsApp group and you're watching now, then Google Friedlander Guide to the Perplexed. And you'll find men, lots of university libraries have available a PDF of that translation. That's a good translation. And, and I would have to warn you, there was a lot of bad translations and they're usually bad because they translated from a translation. In other words, if you were a scholar in Europe and you went to the Ibn Tibbon Hebrew and you translated from that into some other language, uh, French, Italian, whatever, which happened many times, you're, you're making a translation of a bad translation. So it gets messed up. So the good ones, the scholarly ones written in the 20th century and the early this century were written by scholars who went back to the original. So, 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 so if we went back to the original, then, um, then we have the Friedlander one. 
which you can get for free. There's one that I'm not aware of it being available for free because it's still being sold. And that's this one. I don't know. Could you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, came out for, by University of Chicago Press by Shlomo Pines, and it was uh, published in the 1960s. And this is still in English, probably the best one out there. And it's the one that I'm going to use. The other one that I use is, is the Hebrew. And that's the Mora Nebuchim by, by Nusara Rav Cook. And this was written by Rabbi Kapach in the, in the it's also in like the Show. 1970s. Yes, go ahead. Show. Yes. Can I suggest that you mute everyone? Because not everybody is muted. And that they'll um, unmute if they want to ask questions. So you can okay. do that as the host. Okay. Well, actually, I made uh, Lowell the host. Okay, then. Hello, yeah, can you, you mute everyone? It. Okay, great. All right. Thanks. So, so, um, so the, the other translation I use in the, in the modern Hebrew is, is the Rabbi Kapach, which is, um, he wrote this in the 1970s. I think of all the modern translations, Rabbi Kapach is the best. The reason why he actually grew up speaking Judeo-Arabic in Yemen and to him translating it into modern Hebrew, and he was a, he was a Talmud Fahama, Torah scholar of the first order. And he, he gave us many translations of a lot of the writings of contemporary rabbis of those times, like the Chobot Talavavot and, and other writings that were written also in Judeo Arabic originally. And he, he gave us new versions, modern Hebrew versions that are really the best. So I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between the, the Shlomo Pines English and the Rabbi Kapach Hebrew. And you guys are going to be following in your own translations. And maybe it'll be fun seeing some of the differences. So, all that aside, I want to, I'm going to touch a little bit on the controversies. Uh, surrounding the Rambam's writing, how uh, and the influence. I mentioned the incredible influence. It's, it's considered by anyone that studies religious philosophy in general, whether Jewish religious philosophy or any religious philosophy, typically lists this as, if, if not the top two or three philosophical works of the medieval time period, certainly in the, in the top 10. And, um, and it, its influence on our religious thinking to, to every, every single day, every single day when we think about religious subjects, the influence is, it's impossible to overstate the influence this book has had on the way we think and the way we approach God and the way we approach the conflicts between religion and the modern world and science. So that, uh, that, that's just all I'm gonna say in terms of its influence. The controversies come because whenever somebody touches the hot rod of religion versus science, he always is going to get embroiled in controversy. So the Rambam was no different. And as we go through many of the ideas that the Rambam uh, studied, you can see why, especially people with a more, uh, uh, a less philosophical and a more fundamental religious approach and a more literalist interpretations of the Torah didn't, and didn't like a lot of what Maimonides had to say, and which resulted in, in book burnings and bannings and so on. But as with all good books, Bannings and burnings typically lead to making them more popular rather than less. So that probably in the end contributed to, to some, of the, um, some of the important influence that the book had. I'm going to now just touch on a few of the major issues that the Rambam deals with. I'm giving you a taste so that you should be excited right, <laughs> to, to attack these things. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about why, how I think this book is going to be so relevant for us every single day. And, and, and why I think it's important that we revive the study of this book, and then we'll start by doing that letter. So some of the issues that he, the Rambam deals with, for example, is, um, is the Rambam uh, explains the nature of prophecy. And for the most part, he makes prophecy into something intellectual as opposed to something spiritual. Um, I mean, according to the Rambam, the connection between the natural world and what we call the spiritual world is, 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 is very tight, very tight connection. Rambam is famous for his minimization of miracles. He's not a big fan of miracles. And he typically will take the, the logical and uh, scientifically valid, uh, scientifically more sensible explanation to explain phenomena that occurred in history, including in Tanakh, rather than take supernatural approaches. The uh, other things that the Rambam is famous for is, um, is for taking what he understood science to be, and he, he explained the physical world the way Aristotle did, um, the Rambam was very much an Aristotelian, but he explained the physical world and the forces which guide them. He would he used the term he, he equated what the Torah calls angels and the forces, godly forces, with what the Rambam viewed as natural forces. So angels and demons 
turn, according to the Rambam, turn into the physical forces of the universe and, and the bad forces of the universe, like, like uh, illnesses and so on. The Rambam equated demons with illnesses in the same way as he equated the physical forces of the world with angels. The Rambam discussed um, the nature of evil and where evil comes from. The Rambam generally did not believe that there was such an entity, certainly no spiritual entity called evil. The Rambam felt that all, pretty much all evil, with some exceptions, is a result of human choice. And if we were to choose to live a good life, and if human beings are choose among ourselves to, to live properly, that evil would basically cease to exist. And that evil and, and suffering is a result of our bad choices. For the most part, that's how the Rambam would look at it. So, so for example, something like, you can imagine how the Rambam would, would, would um, discuss a question like how, how could you know, something like the Holocaust happen? The Rambam would point his fingers at, 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 at humanity, at, at humanity's mistakes. Another thing that the Rambam did was, was discuss, and the third section of the book, we'll get there in several years, is the reasons behind the mitzvot. Rabbi, can I ask a quick question? Please, go ahead, yes. So he, so he would say that like the Yates or hurrah or something like that, where as an example, Adam and right. Eve pre-sin in the Garden of Eden, Yes. Before, I mean, they were basically Adam, at least on the level of an angel. Um, you know, how does he explain, you know, that 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 was a, a, a pattern of his choice? It had to be the Yetzirah Ra influencing that choice. No. Yeah, well, there, there is a, a and the Ramam will discuss it in more detail. I'm really just barely touching on the idea. We're going to hear the Ramam out. It'll be a while, but we're going to get there eventually. Um but the, the nature of the human choice is that we can make selfish choices. It's a selfishness that comes from within us. Um, and, and how the Ramam studies the Ganeda and, you know, and what happened with the serpent and, and, the, and the eating of the Eitzadat. And just, I don't know the level of Hebrew knowledge of everyone online. So I'll translate the Eitzadat being the tree of knowledge. It's something the Ramam himself discusses and we will go into that in detail. I, I, I'm not trying to avoid the question. I just don't wanna, I just don't wanna give a lecture which is not uh, I'm trying to touch on some ideas to give you a taste so that you're curious so that you stick with this for the next few months. <laughs> anyway, so, um, um, and so, and then the other thing is like this, the reason why people, this is the last thing I'm going to say before we start, and that is, is that people get scared of learning this book because it's philosophical, and he uses Aristotelian terms, and we tend, tend to, most of us tend to shy away from the philosophy department in college. Because these are not, it's not the way we think. It's not, it's just, Aristotle doesn't talk to us today. And, um, and, and the people that generally study this are the, are the ivory tower types that are sitting and analyzing uh, how Maimonides approaches Aristotle versus how this one approaches this one and this. And, 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 and when you go off in that direction, um, it makes it less and less relevant to us in the modern time. But that's, but I think it's extremely important. I'm going to do this all the time. I'm not going to. I'm not an Aristotelian philosopher, nor am I an expert. I'm just an educated Jew who and lo who loves Judaism and is educated in modern science. And this is what the Rambam was talking about. His modern science was Aristotle, seen through the eyes of 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 the Islamic scholars such as Avicenna, seen through the 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 medical science of Galen seen through the Islamic thinkers of the Muta Kalamun, which is an Islamic sect that the Rambam quotes a lot from. But that was his world of general knowledge. And the Rambam deals with the conflicts between that world of knowledge, which in his time was the height of scientific knowledge, and the Torah. What, what do you do when the two don't jive, when they don't fit, when the things that the Rambam knew to be true seem to conflict with what the Torah seems to say? How do we reconcile that? Now, we have those same exact problems every day. When we learn the Torah and it says something that conflicts with what we know to be true, whether it's something that we believe in for moral reasons, something that we find bothersome because it's morally bothersome to us, and the Torah says something and we can't, we just don't get it, how do you deal with that? Or something that seems to conflict with what we know from modern science as fact. How do we deal with that? And as we go through the Rambam and we see the way he resolves his conflicts, we find incredible amount of guidance to how we can resolve our conflicts. And, and another 
and one of the things that we're going to learn is that the primary thing the Ramam does is not change what he knows to be true. The Ramam never, ever will deny what he knows to be true based on science, because it's true. What the Ramam does is he goes back to the Torah to see what the Torah really says, not what it seems to say or not what so-and-so thinks it says, but what it actually says. With all that, we can now start with the letter. So what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to be reading pretty much from my English. If you follow in whichever English translation you have, if somebody sees a, a word or a phrase that's translated differently, then feel free to say so and feel free to cut in and, and let me know. Because I'm working with these two, the Kapach Hebrew and the Pines English. The Rambam begins, I'm going to begin with the letter and the letter starts with a, uh, with a quote of a verse. And the quote of a verse I'm going to talk about for a few moments. B'shem Adonai El Olam. That's how the Ramam starts. It's in the name of God, the Lord of the world, of the universe. Now, that is a direct quote from Bereshit, from Genesis, from, from uh, at, uh, chapter 23, um, verse 21, verse 33, which is um, right after the Berit, the covenant that Avraham made with Avimelech. Um, uh, and they agreed to have peace between each other. And it says they planted a tree to celebrate the covenant that they made. And they, he called there in the name of God. Now, it's interesting because the Rambam not and Kapach uh, note, uh, notes this, that, um, that um, the Rambam often starts his books with this phrase. Um, and it's, uh, it's not just here. He starts it... Um, many of his books, uh, he begins with the same phrase. And Rabbi Kapach hints to this, and I'm going to expound a little more. It's actually very, very revealing. And I'll explain why. Because many of us are familiar with the famous Rambam who describes how it is that Abraham became the father of the chosen people. And indeed, how, why is it that there's even such a thing? How is it that the Jews became the chosen people? And what does the concept of chosen people even mean? So, and this I'm gonna go into a little bit of depth because this is really important to understanding the Rambam and especially important to understand why he chose this verse to begin this book. And we can also get a little bit of insight into the Rambam's own understanding of himself and his role as a teacher of Judaism to generations, just simply by these four, this choice of four words. <laughs> the Rambam believed and wrote, and many are, are familiar from his Mishnah Torah that Abraham, our, our forefather Abraham, became the one who was chosen to bring the message of monotheism to the world because he, as a young child, looked around at the idol worship that was going on, realized intellectually that it made no sense. And from that, he concluded that there must be one God. And because of that, God appeared to Abraham and said, I am going to choose you to be the one who brings that message to the world. There is a ton, so much, so much power in that, in that idea. The idea being that according to Rambam, the intellectual achievement of truth based on a person's own thinking and a person's own understanding by looking around at the world around him and, and observing that is the achievement that happened with Abraham. And it's why Abraham's descendants became the nation chosen to bring that message to the rest of the world. Key here being that we need to come to an intellectual understanding of God on our own, on a, on a, by thinking, by looking around at the world around us and understanding that there's some purpose to everything that we see. The Rambam himself chose this verse because to start the book, to be the header of this book, plus many of his very influential works, because he viewed himself as a member of that, as a prominent and important person, and justifiably so, he chose himself as a teacher of this idea because he himself achieved that intellectual level of knowing God and knowing the existence of God and then teaching it to the world. And, and probably more than anyone else in history post-biblical times, whether Jew or non-Jew, Maimonides was probably that, uh, fulfilled that, um, that mission. So the, 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 cho the choice of that verse is, is very profound and very important. So he begins with that verse, and now I'm going to start reading the letter. My honored pupil, my honored student, Rabbi Joseph. So this name of the student is Rabbi Joseph. May God protect you. 
you, Joseph, the son of Rabbi Judah, Rabbi Yehuda, may he rest in peace. This Rabbi Joseph was a, a student who came from somewhere across North Africa. I, I don't know the name of the town where he was from, but it sounds like it must have been in the area of Morocco. And remember the Rambam wrote this, he had already been living in Egypt for a long time. So to go from Morocco to Egypt in those days, that's a, quite a long trip all the way across Northern Africa. And he came to the Rambam to study. So the Rambam is reminiscing a little bit about when, how he met him. And he says, when you came to me, you, because you had conceived the intention, in other words, you had thought that you wanted to travel from a country so far away because you wanted to read books under my guidance. You wanted to read through texts. This is a hint towards reading through the texts of the Torah. What Rabbi Joseph, and we're going to see this in a second, even more, was, was concerned about was that he's reading through the texts of the Torah. And a lot of it just doesn't make sense, doesn't work. And he wanted to know from the Rambam, knowing that the Rambam had so such an incredible education in philosophy, the Rambam might be able to help him out in understanding how to read through these texts. So Maimonides says, I had a very high opinion of you because I could tell that you had a tremendous desire of inquiry. And because you wrote to me letters, and this was customary in those days, Rabbi Kapach mentioned that if someone was to, wanted to uh, come as a student and study under a great leader, a teacher, a rabbi, or whatever, he would write some letters, some samples of his wisdom, of his writing, and send it ahead. So, so he had sent uh, poems, uh, uh, which is a very common way, uh, 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 poems written. So the Rambam says, I saw that I had already seen that you had written quality poems. So I knew you were smart, right? But, um, but I hadn't yet had a chance to put you to the test to see if, if maybe you're just a good poet, you know, maybe you're not so smart, but, um, but, uh, but, uh, but I, I had a chance, I, want, I wanted to see. The, um, so, I, so I said to myself, and this is kind of funny here, where the Rama says, I said to myself, maybe he, his desire is stronger than his knowledge. In other words, maybe he's not as smart. Maybe he wants to learn, but maybe he's not so smart. Let me test him out and see if he's worth, worthwhile as a student. Uh, the one thing you'll, we will sense in the, in the words of the Rambam throughout is, is a, a, a some level of a condescending tone towards uneducated people. Um, uh, you'll see what you think as we read through it. But, um, the, the, uh, but the Rambam really wasn't interested in wasting his time teaching someone who, had, who would never have a chance to actually learn. So then he says, but then you came to me, and this is really revealing. What was the first thing we studied together? You came to me because you had a problem with understanding texts of the Torah. But we started by studying astronomy. And before we start astro astronomy, we actually started studying mathematics because we couldn't understand astronomy, the Ramam says, unless you understand mathematics. And then I was able to say, hey, my, the Ramam says, I became really happy with you because I could see the excellence of your mind. Now I see he's a smart guy. He knows math. He knows astronomy. He's a smart guy. This guy can get it. Now, and, I, and, not, and more than that, the Rambam points out, and this is so true, a good teacher noticed this, not just that he had the skill, but I saw that your longing for mathematics was great. You had a tremendous amount of desire. So what does a good teacher do? He lets him teach himself. So the Rambam says, I let you train yourself and work on studying mathematics and astronomy. This is actually astounding because here we have one of the greatest Torah scholars of all time. We have a person who traveled, well, pretty much halfway across the known world to study Torah under him. And he, he spends the entire, most of his training, at least in the beginning of his training, studying math and astronomy. And that's how the Rambam learned uh, who he was. Then the Rambam says, once I saw that, that, that you know, uh, uh, in other words, right, and hence I let you train yourself in the science of mathematics and astronomy, knowing, and here's the thing where you see some differences in translations. The, the English Prime says, knowing where you would end. Uh, Kapach has a much better one in Hebrew saying, when I knew what the final result was going to be, when I was able to see in you that there was a future. It doesn't mean where you would end and you know, where you're going to stop learning. It means I could see that, that, there's, that there's a tremendous amount of potential. So then, uh, I, I, then I started to teach you more. I started to teach you the art of logic. Okay? And once I saw that, that you had the, the science of logic down, now I had my, my hopes fastened upon you, right? Wh which is um, 
uh, which is how the Ram said, now I knew your guy I'm going to teach. And I saw that now I know I can teach you Torah. Now I can go, we can go through the words of the Nevi'im of the prophets together. And now you can understand the prophets because now you have the basis, you have the knowledge that you need to look at the words of the prophets. And think about this for a minute and how that differs from the way Torah is taught in schools today. But I just, uh, I'm not going to comment too much. I'll let you think on your own. If anyone, um, I, 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 after I finish reading the letter, we'll have some, you know, some time for discussion. And I'm interested to hear what people have to say. But then I, I, I wanted to study the words of the prophets so that you would, I'm reading the Vines translation, so that you would consider in them that which perfect men ought to consider. In other words, so that now you can study the prophets, learn the prophets, and understand what a real person, a really knowledgeable person could really understand when they study the Torah. Now you can study the Torah and get it, is really what the Ramam is saying. Then I started to let you see what the Ramam calls certain flashes, certain flashes, meaning I show you little bits. When we learn this pasuk, this verse, I can, I can give you a little hint as to what it really means, as to what it really is trying to say. And, and little flashes of knowledge so that you can start to understand my approach, the Ramam is saying. Then I saw that you wanted to know even more. And I realized, the Ramam says, and it's kind of fishy now, that you had already been looking for answers somewhere else by the Mutakalim, right? I could see that you were already reading the Muslim scholars and see how they deal with the science and how they deal with the conflicts between science and religion. So, so you started asking me, right? Uh, to, 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 to tra and I knew that because you started asking me to translate for you uh, and to argue or to uh, uh, back up or whatever, some of the ideas that the Muta Kalman were, were trying, were, were using and saying. And the Ramam is going to quote Muta Kalman's approach many times in order to use their approach in, in studying the Torah and many times in order to refute it. That they're going to pop up, these Muslim scholars are going to pop up often in this book. Um, so, so as I, and once I saw that you had already acquired a little bit of this knowledge from other people, I can see, and here's the key word, that you were perplexed. You were confused, right? You were very confused. How do I make this work? Because you wanted to find out something that made sense, and you still hadn't yet come to something that made sense. You were all confused by the conflicts between what you had studied and the Torah. You were confused between the approach of the Muslims and yourself. You were confused between, uh, you know, how do I understand the words of the, of the prophets? So I didn't, I, I didn't stop trying to dissuade you, the Ramam says. In other words, I kept trying to tell you, leave it alone, leave it alone. But you kept on, you kept on uh, pushing. So therefore, I have told you to approach it in an orderly manner. We're going to work through this ourselves. And the result of that is the book we're about to study together. And the Ramam says, my purpose in this was that I wanted the truth to be established in your mind according to proper methods. And should not come to you by accident. What the Ramam says by accident, accident is is uh, is an English translation, but but the, the 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 what the Rama means when he says accident is is when you and when you study something on its simple level and you don't delve into its depth. So you just read it and get it without without actually thinking about the, the ramifications, thinking about what it really means. And according to the Rambam, that's as good as an accident. Now, whenever there, so, and then the Ramam says, when and now, whenever, remember, you came to me because you wanted to know about these texts. Whenever you read a biblical text or some text from the Chazal, from the rabbis, and it's and it points and it seems to indicate some strange notion. That's an English translation of of a davar muzar of a strange, unusual thing that seemingly sounds strange. Literally, it sounds strange. It can't possibly be that this is what they actually meant. And um. I did not refrain, the Ramam says, from explaining to you what it really meant. Unfortunately, the Ramam says, when God decided it was our time to separate and you needed to travel, um, because you left and we had only barely started and I needed to continue, that's why I decided to write this book. And I'm writing it for you and for other people like you, however few there are. This is kind of funny again, because the Ramam is saying that uh, however few there are that people that are intelligent enough to realize that these conflicts exist. Um, so because of you and other people like you, I am writing this book. All of them that are written down will reach you where you are. One by one, I'm gonna send you chapter by chapter. I have your address, be in good health. And that's the end of the letter.
So that's the, our little introduction. We now know why the Rambam wrote it. We now know what he's going to try to solve. Uh, and we learned a little bit about his pedagogical approach. Uh, I want to open the floor now for questions or comments or, or criticisms or whatever you want. <laughs> And uh, Hillel, if, you, um, uh, if you're able to open it up to anyone that wants to say something. Steve, did you want to say something? Yeah, so um, first of all, thank you. It's fascinating. Are we to take this literally as in there really was a person? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yes, there really was. It's not like the Kuzari, which may have been um, you know, notional. This is a real person. No, this is a real person. And these were real letters that the Ramam actually wrote to us. Uh, he was he was from a town in Hebrew. The town he was from was called um, uh, Sibato. That's so, spelled in Hebrew. Samach Yud Bet Teth um, Vav. I, I don't know what that corresponds to. If someone could. If I, I tried Google Translate. The Hebrew they didn't catch. Give me an English city to translate. I did. If someone could tell me what that town is, uh, but it's an actual place somewhere across North Africa. But I, I, I know it's in North Africa someplace because Kapach says so, but he doesn't identify it. But it is an actual person. Could you tell us what his background was? He was, I mean, Maimonides was in his 50s, you said. Was this a young guy? Uh, did, what kind of training? Student? Did he have? Rabbi, student? Rabbi Joseph. I don't know. I, that's a good question. I really don't know where I could get. There's, there must be somewhere I can get more biographical material. The only source that I had is what Rabbi Kapach writes in his footnotes. And all he mentions is the town he was from and that it was in North Africa and that he was a real person. But I, I'm sorry, I, I, but it's an interesting question though. Uh, any other? Uh, so any other? In, in the Friedlander, it says yes. that I refer to the time when I received your voices in prose and verse from Alexandria. That would have been pretty close to the Maimonides. Ramam was in, was in Cairo. Right, so um, I, I'm, I'm confused. You know, by... you know what, I actually, because he came, I think he came to Alexandria and wrote the letters, sent them ahead, and then came to, uh, to I think I remember reading that somewhere. Like he, he, he was wrote it from Alexandria, but I'm pretty sure the Rama would not have described it as coming from so far away if he had traveled just from Alexandria to Cairo. And, and he specifically mentions it's across North Africa. Uh, so yeah. Um, but it, it, he'd say translate from Alexandria. I don't have that in any of the other translations. That's interesting. I wonder where they got that from. This is great. I, I've read a number of um, uh, books on, on Ramban, and in each one, uh, they reference the um, Guide for the Perplexed and how complicated it is. And I've always been intimidated by even trying to attempt it. Uh, and I happen to be into philosophy and, and logic and things like that. I can't tell you how excited I am, that, that Rabbi. You're doing this. I mean, this is well, great. So thank you, and and well, Rabbi Herzl, of course. Well, you're welcome. And uh, unfortunately, people get scared and intimidated by it, but we shouldn't because it's so many people could gain from this approach. You know, it, it really, really helps. It really helps the perplexed. That's why he wrote it. You know, and and if you're not perplexed in modern days then you're just not, I don't know, you're not reading, you're not learning, you're just not. <laughs> you, know, you, you must be perplexed if you, if you have even a modicum of education, you know. I have one, one more question. I, sure. I, I learned from a, a black hat rabbi, and when this yeah. came up, the topic, he said, I don't have any questions. Uh, Judaism answers all my questions. I don't need to, uh, uh, there's no need for me to read this. I don't have questions. I, have a, I get the answers. Well, I'm going to say one thing. Uh, one of the things that you're going to learn from the Rambam, when you finish this book, you're going to have thousands more questions than answers. I promise you. The Rambam, literally, he says this on several occasions. He says, I'm going to give you flashes. I'm going to help give you ways to think. But more than anything is he gives you permission to ask. And he gives you permission to not, to not know the answer, but just to search for the answer. The, 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 that I, I don't know who made that statement, but whoever made that statement doesn't know a, a smidgen of what Jewish philosophy is about. Um, you know, because if, if anyone thinks they have all the answers, then then well, they're never going to learn anything. That's for sure. But uh, I'll I'm telling my husband that, but <laughs> <laughs> he knows everything. 
or maybe he does know everything, you know, or maybe there's somebody that just knows it all. But any other comments or questions? Well, so first of all, th very excited to do this. I've read many books on Rambam. I've never been willing to, you know, uh, to tackle this. So thank you. But you alluded to years. How long do you expect? Oh, this to take? Yeah. So I, I have a feeling that I, I, it, this could take us 20 years. It could take us uh, several months. It all depends on how we approach it. But, but I think that um, I don't want to do much more text than what I did today in a, in a session because too much it'll just it'll, it'll just we won't gain anything we may end up skipping parts there there's there's certain parts that he gets so deep into Aristotelian logic that other than I'm sorry I don't remember your name but the woman who spoke before who said that she's into philosophy she might get it but most of us right. will, will start okay you might so you might I might have to assign you to read a few paragraphs on your own but I may skip some things I think there's value to those too, even if we, but, but, but so, so I, I don't know how long it's going to take. I, I really don't. I'm, I'm going to guess a year. That's what I'll, I'll guess for now. Maybe, maybe longer. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, uh, if you want to, there's a lot of people that write about Sonoma. There's, there's so many books. I mean, it's impossible to tell you, you know, and, and, and people take it in all different directions. But um, but there's nothing could replace just learning the book for itself. I mean, I I don't care you know what anyone says. There's simply no no replacement for just studying his own words. And what any other comments before we close up for today? Uh, Ralph Shalom, can you tell us again what what uh, text you're working from in, in the translation? Yes, yes. The, the the English I'm working. You can buy this online. This is by Shlomo Pines. It's printed by University of Chicago Press. And it's the Guide of the Perplexed. It's a two volume set. This one is yellow. The second volume is usually green. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you can probably buy it used on Amazon, you know, for a reasonable price. I don't- um, Used on Amazon for $31 and new it's $38. I bought okay. it. <laughs> All right, perfect. And then if you want the, um, from the Hebrew, there, there's, the one I've used my whole life, and this is what I, I studied Rambam several times. I went to Mornuvukum with Rabbi Kapach. So he's my favorite of all the translations. It's closest to my heart because that's the one that I studied. But there is a more recent one, and I, I, I don't remember her name, but uh, a Hebrew University professor of, uh, of Arabic Judaic studies, um, she published it within the last decade or so. A new, she also went back to the original Arabic and translated into modern Hebrew. I don't know if hers is better or worse or the same or just different than Kapach's, um, uh, but you, you might want to look at it. Well, the one that I would not recommend is the one that they probably, if you went to any yeshiva, the one that they had on the back shelf, because they had to have a more Nebuchadnezzar there because it was like a standard, mm -hmm. but no one ever actually took it off the shelf and read it. If it's the Ibn Tibbon translation, even though that was the one that the Rama himself saw and signed off on, I told you, you can break your teeth trying to read it and understand it. You, you can try and be my guest, but it, 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 it's, um, no. it, it, it's very difficult reading and, and it's just not. It's, sure. Rabbi, can you either put it in the chat or show the cover again? I had you in a thumb, you know, a little thumb, thumb print. I couldn't get yeah. the color. Let me put it. Could someone else just write? Uh, uh, okay. And, and by the way, the Safaria Hebrew is the Ibn Tibbon Hebrew. So if you read the Safaria in Hebrew, I, you, that's one good way you can try it and you'll see what I mean by it being very difficult to interpret it. No matter how good your Hebrew is, you're going to struggle. Um, and, and, uh, and, but and the Safari English is Freelander and Freelander is decent. It's a decent translation, but it's, 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 it's older English and it's not as, it doesn't flow as nicely, but the Freelander English is fine. And that's free that if you don't want to buy anything, then just go with the Freelander and you should be okay. Thanks. Hello. Oh, he just put it okay excellent All yeah right. great anything else any anyone else have something to contribute will you have any class notes or anything like that for each session or are we on our own or what i think you're on your own <laughs> <laughs> um I, I i scribbled my own notes but um I, you don't want to read these you won't the doctor's handwriting <laughs> <laughs>
Do you intend for us, or would it be useful for us to know what you're going to cover in each class and then read ahead? Um, sure, that's a good idea. And I'll, you know what, I'll do it right now, and I'll also remind you. The next, the, ne the next thing we're going to study is the introduction. This is the Rambam's introduction, the Ptich, the Ptich in Hebrew. And um, uh, let me see. The, the paragraphs are different in the different translations. But if, if you um, look at the introduction, I'm looking at the, the Pines translation. It ends with, that is why I have called this book the Guide of the Perplexed. That's, I'm going to go up to there. So starting from the beginning of the introduction to that. So that's like two or three paragraphs, depending on how they divide it up. If we go through it really fast, I might continue until um, where he where he mentions Chazal and the Rambam says the sages may their memory be blessed. The rabbis also write in parables and riddles. The Rambam had made the point, and I'm jumping way ahead of myself because this is next week. Talks about how the Torah often writes in metaphor. So often what people and he's writing that because that's one of one of the primary methods the Rambam uses to answer conflicts between science and the Torah is to explain that the Torah is speaking in metaphor and it's not meant to be taken literally. The Rama makes the point that Chazal, the rabbis also speak in metaphor um, and I might go up to there. So if you go up to that point, you can be prepared. Is that, do you guys, does that work? Yeah, so that's four paragraphs in the Friedlander. Yes, okay, in the Friedlander. Okay, fine. So for those that are using the Friedlander translation, that will be the first four paragraphs of the, of the of Rambam's introduction. I have had, and you mentioned someone, and, and I, I have to be frank because I've had this debate with some, you met, someone mentioned a rabbi with a black hat, I forget who it was that said that. And I have yeah. nothing against people with black hats, but I do have something against people. And there's a lot of people that don't like what the Ramam has to say and have different philosophies. And that's totally fine too. You, whatever philosophy pulls your boat is fine with me. I'm not here to say this one is right or that one is wrong. But I do have a problem with people who deny that the Rambam said what he actually said. So I had this debate, I'm not gonna say with whom, but somebody mentioned to me uh, that, you know, uh, the, somebody who's a, a literalist, who believes in the absolute truth of everything the Chazal, the rabbis say. And I told him that the Rambam says not that way. The Rambam says clearly that very often they don't mean what they, that literally what they say, but they're speaking in parables. And he said, no, he doesn't say that. And then I, I, I showed him the quote black on white. I was just telling this to my son the other night. I, show, I, I showed him the Moronabukhan. Here, you open it up and read his words. And it, it was mind boggling because after reading the words, he still told me that he didn't really say that. That is completely intellectually dishonest. It's oh, totally fine because there's other thinkers, there's many other thinkers in, in, the, in the pantheon of Jewish philosophers that disagreed with the Rambam. Some of them practically burned the Rambam. And that's totally fine. Well, disagreement is great, but don't, not denying the truth. That's the one thing that's completely unacceptable. To deny that the Rambam said what the Rambam said is, is, is beyond the pale, in my opinion. So if someone wants to debate me by claiming that the Rambam didn't actually say what he actually wrote a whole book to say, then, then, then that I, I, just, I just can't deal with that kind of denial. So but I'm isn't, sorry I put it out I'm there. sorry. <laughs> isn't it the case, though, that the, that the Rambam... And we, we don't, you know, I'm sure we'll get, get to this, contradicted himself. I mean, but he, there are times, you know, there are things he says in Moran Mur, that he, he doesn't later stand up for. Yeah, there, there, are, there are cases of contradictions and, and the Maimonidean scholars, and there are many Maimonidean scholars have spilled mountains of books, uh, mountains of ink, trying to explain some of those contradictions. And the, the various methods are, this is what he really thought, but he wrote that for the masses is one approach that they sometimes take. He changed his mind at different times of his life. Maybe the Rambam himself had different opinions that happened to conflict with each other. I mean, you or I probably uh, could contradict ourselves often enough. So sometimes <laughs> there's numerous ways to understand them. Um, but, but, but the key thing is though, is that some of the things that he says in Moran of Uchim that are highly controversial that he does in Mishnah Torah, for example, contradict um, at least it by him writing it in Mon Ravuchim, he legitimizes it within the within legitimate Jewish theology. It says, you know what, this philosophy is good and this philosophy is good, but they're both acceptable and within the bounds, you know. 
And, and that's why even if he does contradict himself, it still remains extremely important. I mean, you can debate which one is really right, but at least you can debate it and, and it's fair. Okay. Any um any other comments before we sign off for the day? Other than this is great. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I think so too. I hope I hope this is going to be fun. All thank right, you everyone. So much. Thank have you. A wonderful thank evening. you. Thank Look you. Look forward to next Wednesday. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, all right. Yes, sir. Okay, so my